right? Praise the Lord. Yeah. Holy, holy. Mm. Boy, that is so true, isn't it? So deep. So great. So high. And nothing can separate us from God's love. That's the that's one of the great truths of that. Nothing can separate us. We're going to be looking today at, um, at a parable that Jesus told in Matthew 25. And for those of you that are familiar with Matthew 25, obviously these are um, a couple of parables in Matthew 25 concerning the kingdom of God and operation within the kingdom of God. And of the 26 parables that Jesus shared, uh, I think this one probably contains more truth uh, than any. Of course, they're all full of God, full of truth, full of life, and they're all purposeful for everything that he, that he, that he shares. The lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, um, tares and wheat. Uh, I mean, you can just go down the list naming some of the great parables that have tremendous truth. This parable is the parable of the talents. And of course, one of the things we have to deal with when we look at the parable of the talents is to understand what is really, what is a talent? Uh, you know, of course, we have a meaning for the word talent and it would probably be defined as a skill or um, a quality that you have that, uh, that's uh, blessed and, and, and good and you're capable in it. But a talent in Jesus' day and a talent in the parable of the talents is talking about a measurement of weight. And especially when it comes to the price of an item. Uh, and, and, and of course, a talent, uh, if it was a talent of gold, it would be worth more than if it was a talent of copper or a talent of silver rather than a talent of aluminum. So the price varied, but the word talent just has to do with the value of, of an item based on its weight. Uh, so it, this parable is really talking about, uh, about money is what it's talking about. However, I do think, and I will do this today and encourage you to do this, to think about not just uh, in connection with money and how God can bless us with, with finances and money and resources, but think about all the things that God blesses us with. Uh, all of the things that, are, that, are, that, are, uh, that he puts into our life and that he fosters into us and that he expands and that he opens the capabilities of in, in all of our lives, not, not just money. But when we read the word talent, that, that's really uh, what it's talking about in the realm of that. But we're gonna just expand it just a little bit and, uh, and we're gonna look at, a par at this parable to see what happens in the unseen realm, in the spiritual realm, uh, in reference to... Uh, to resources and giftings and why some people seem to get more and more and more while others may even lose the little that they, they have and, and what controls that? And we're gonna look at five truths that come out of this parable. So let's just read the parable, Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one, he gave five talents to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Now, I want, you to, I want to call attention to this because that's really an important concept. It didn't, it didn't say he gave them a talent and, and that created their ability. It, it says that he had measured their ability and that he gave them these talents based on what his ability uh, observation of their ability was. All right, so this is not just some helter skelter, I'll give you five, I'll give you two, and give you one. Let's see what you do with them. This, this is a measured, this is God, God had examined these lives and he gave them these talents based on what they had exhibited before their abilities. All right, verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. Kind of anti-Robin Hood, you know? All right. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has, will be taken away. So there are five truths here about God's blessing in our life and how to stand in a place and live in a place, walk in a way in which the blessings of God, whether we're talking about physical, uh, financial, uh, uh, talent-wise, uh, wisdom, knowledge, any, any of those areas of life, that we need God to bless us in, which would be all of them, right? <laughs> yeah. You look at your neighbor and say, oh, in every area. Yeah, that's what we, yeah, we want God's blessing in every area of our life. So there are five truths that, uh, that determine that. And the conclusion is that if you obey these truths, then you will be a happy person because God, you stand to be blessed by God because you're standing in his truth. And if you disobey these, then you'll find yourself sad because you are not aligning with God's truth and allowing God the opportunity to bless your life. In other words, if you don't obey these truths, you're not even in the area code where God can bless your life, uh, where something almost could accidentally even bless your life. And you lose even that which seemingly you have. So what are these truths? Now, obviously, we're not gonna get to all of them today. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Um, I'm gonna try to get four of them and then leave the biggest one for next week. All right, gotta bring you back, you know. Gotta, gotta have a two-parter. All right, truth number one is the truth of ownership. In this parable, uh, there's a lord, a, a master, a, a, a rich man that gives his possessions to someone else for them to manage while he's gone. So the number one truth of blessing in our lives as Christians is that, is that we don't own anything because God owns everything. And we have to treat everything as if it's owned by God and that we don't own anything. Let me give you a couple of passages of scripture. Uh, Psalms 24, one, the earth is the Lord's. That's pretty straightforward, right? The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. So not only does the earth belong to the Lord and everything that belongs to the earth, but all of us belong to him, that we're not even, our, we, we don't even own ourselves. Look, let me give you another passage, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verse nine. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So God owns us. And the greatest deception that we can have in our life is to think that we own something. Now, of course, this flies in the face of Americans because we think we own things. <laughs> and and we and, and th this house belongs to me. This automobile belongs to me. Um, 
this furniture is mine. Uh, you know, uh, I own all of this. Well, I'll just remind you that God is not an American, uh, although I think God loves America. Uh, <laughs> I hope he does. Um, and, and I love America. You know this. Um, even in the crazy state that it's in, it's still a wonderful place, and we love America. I hope America lasts forever, but God's not an American. God has his own kingdom. And the truth about that is that uh, I'd love for America to last as long as the earth lasts, but even if it did, uh, a trillion years from now, God's kingdom would still be in existence. So everything belongs to God. Have you noticed this about life? I, I don't know if you, do you ever check the mortality rates? You know what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about the mortality rate? Um, I, last time I looked at it, the mortality rate of the earth is right at 100%. Um, the only two people I know that didn't die and left this earth were uh, Enoch and Elijah. And of course, Jesus died, but he, the, but, he, but he rose from the grave, so we won't count Jesus. But just normal human beings like us, Enoch and Elijah are the only two that made it out of here alive. And what I'm getting at is the Bible says that God formed us from the dust of the, of the earth, and when we die, our body goes back to the dust of the earth in some form or another. So we need to realize that we're not gonna take anything with us. If we owned something, then we would be able to take it with us. Your hearse is not gonna have a U-Haul behind it. And I know you've heard that a million times, but it's the absolute truth. And I had a pastor friend one time that was preaching a revival and uh, he, he forgot all of his suits at home. I was back when all of us wore suits all the time at church. And he forgot his suits. So the church he went to, the pastor said, hey man, don't worry about it, I'll get you a suit. And, uh, and so the pastor knew the funeral director in, in his town and he went down and he got a suit from the funeral director. And so that night when the evangelist put it on, he said, look, I put it on, you know, and it, it looked good, it fit, everything. But he said, when I went, went to put my hands in my pockets like this, he said, it did, they didn't have any pockets. And I thought, now that is apropos, really. Because, I mean, if you get a suit from the funeral home, it doesn't even have pockets in it. You know why? You don't need any pockets. Because even if you did have pockets and you put something in it, a hundred years from now, somebody digs up your grave, let's just say, and they get into your pockets, whatever was in there is gonna still be in there. Because the truth is, you can't take anything with you. That house that you say you own, that you are living in, when you go away, somebody else is gonna be living in that house. It's not going with you. Your automobile that you drive, that you own, that you pay those big notes, uh, when you leave, somebody else will be driving that automobile because that automobile is not going with you. So God will bless you with an abundance as long as you remember where it came from and who it belongs to. So who are we responsible to? We are responsible to God with our bodies, with our families, with the property that comes to us, with all of... Uh, all of the goods of life that God has blessed us with. So we don't have the right to take what belongs to God and dig a hole and bury it and put it in the ground because it's not ours, it belongs to him. And so before I go any direction in life, before I decide what I'm gonna do for a living, before I decide who I'm gonna marry, before I decide whether I'm going to college or not, or whatever direction of life I'm going in, the first thing I need to do is ask the one who owns everything, including me, if that is the direction he wants me to go in. And so God says, if you will remember that and you'll give me the responsibility of being the owner of everything, I will bless your life and I will send things into your life for you to manage because it all belongs to me. He gives us our abilities, our talents, our life, our strength, our wisdom, our knowledge, and you could just go on writing down a list. Everything that we need to live a blessed life belongs to him, and we need to know that, and we need to acknowledge that, and we need to put our abilities under his leadership because our abilities belong to him, just like we do. Truth number one, God owns everything. It's not yours. You need to check with him. 
when you decide to do something with your life, your ability, your strength, your finance, whatever, whatever it may be, may be, because he's the owner. Truth number two, the truth of dominion. Um, the word dominion means to, well, to subdue or dominate. So the Lord gave us dominion when he created the earth. And we lost that dominion. But then Jesus came and gave the, our dominion back in many areas of, of life where we are intended to subdue things and, ha, and have uh, responsibility over some things. Uh, I mean, here it is in, in this parable. He gives one five talents, he gives one two talents, and he gives one one talent. And I told you, uh, according to their ability. That word ability there is dunamis, which means... Um, um, demonstrated capacity. So he looks at these servants, and, and I know it looks like God's playing favorites here in some way, but the fact is God is not playing favorites. God loves all of us the same. I know you're aware of this, but some people don't think that. Some people think that some people are loved by God more than others, but you're not. We all, we're all loved the same. God loves you just as much as he loves me. He loves, he, loves, he loves me just as much as he loves anybody out there. there are, God plays no favorites is what I'm saying. And so in this parable, uh, God is just being a good steward. Uh, that's an old word, isn't it? You hadn't heard that word a lot. A good steward, a good caretaker. Um, and, and, and he doesn't want to waste his resources. So what he does in this parable is he gives each of these men what they can, what they can handle, what they can rule over. I mean, you, you have to learn what, to, to steward what you have so that God can, can give you more in life because God is not going to waste his resources. And so if I want God to bless my life in these areas, then I have to learn how to use the blessings of God for my enjoyment. I mean, God gives us things to enjoy and for, uh, for my, uh, my resources and, and to advance the kingdom of God. So what is our demonstrated capacity? What has God observed about our life so that he can pour blessings into our life? Matthew 25, verse 21, look at this. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Here, here it is. You were faithful over a few things. So the master observes that he has been faithful over these things. He has demonstrated a capacity to rule over these few things that his master gave him. So now the master says, I will make you ruler over many things. So as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, we, we, we were created with dominion. Let me just show you in Genesis 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God created us to have authority, to dominate, if you want to use that word. But we lost it when we sin, and we're removed from the garden. And then Jesus comes, and he, he blesses us again with, with authority in our life. So in all the areas of our life, uh, uh, we we are to have dominion. Uh, and I, I wrote down just a few because I, I know sometimes when you're thinking about this, you just, you, you, you limit yourself on, on your dominion. Let me just mention a few that I wrote down. Business, education, ministry, the arts, government, marriage, family, influence, wealth, athletics, banking, uh, and, and you could go on. Let's talk about business for just one moment. Do any of you know the Kathy family. I know there are a lot of Kathys in the world, but have you ever heard of the Kathy family? Well, I know you've observed their business. If you ride up and down Highway 49, um, you'll observe that there's one of these uh, restaurants or, uh, uh, oh, anyway, I've lost the word that I wanted to say. <laughs> one of these restaurants, for lack of a better word to call it, that always has a couple of lines going around it every day, no matter what time you go there, and, um, and you see it every day, except Sunday, because they're not, closed, they're not open on Sunday. And of course, I'm talking about Chick-fil-A. The Kathy family owns Chick-fil-A, and I know that it's not going to surprise you for me to tell you that the Kathy family is an extremely um, fine Christian family. 
and that they teach seminars on dominion, about having dominion. And they believe that their dominion in life is chicken. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine you're praying and you're asking, Lord, what is my dominion? What am, what am I to have dominion over? And a chicken pops into your mind. And you say, Lord, wait, no, Lord, no. Uh, I'm talking about like gold or oil or something like that. But, but, but a chicken? Well, that chicken, that little chicken's made them multi-billionaires, one of the richest families in America, because they have taken dominion over that chicken. Well, you don't have to have to take dominion over something that's going to make you a multi-millionaire, but we should be praying for what the Lord would have us to have dominion over because you were created to have dominion and it may not, it, it may not be some gigantic business or some um, huge uh, leader in the world like, like a lot of times we think about when we talk, think about God's will, you know, and praying, God, you have a will for my life. You created me for something and you created me to have dominion over something in life. So Lord, what is it that I'm having, what is it that I'm to have dominion over? Because God's will is perfectly suited for you and perfectly fitted for you and perfectly designed for you because this is what you were created for. It's what God wants you to do. And it's what God wants for your life and what the devil fears greatest, and that is that you might actually find out what it is that God created you for and, and realize what God can do through your life if you take dominion over those things. The master said, because you've been faithful over a few things, I'm gonna make you ruler over many. Uh, God, God is just finding out what we, what, what we can rule over. The Kathy started with one restaurant. And now they're chains. I, I guess they're probably a worldwide chain by now. Cain's Restaurant did the same thing. Uh, started with one, with one little restaurant somewhere and then God blessed it and now it's all over the, all over the world. But you, you have to start with what you have right now and God watches us operate with what we have now to gauge whether we can handle more. He observes our capacity. You remember the last couple of verses in that parable, verse 28 and 29, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. And then this is what seems so unfair. For to everyone who has, more will be given. Who has, who has what? Who has the ability <laughs> to steward and take dominion over? For all of those who have the, the ability to steward and take dominion over that which is given, he's gonna give more to. And he says, and to him who has not, has not what? Ha, does not have the ability to steward over what he even has right now. God says, you're gonna lose even what you have. So what are you doing with what you have right now? Jesus said it this way, he who's faithful in least is also faithful in much, and he who is faithful in least is, uh, is unfaithful in least is also unfaithful in much. You know, sometimes we, we, we tell ourselves a lie. We say, you know, well, uh, you know, I would take care of what I have now, but what I have now is so crummy that, you know, it's really not worth taking care of. And I don't want to get used to it. I don't, you know, so I, I don't really even want it in my life. So I'm not going to take care of it. I want it to go away. But if I got something better, then, man, I, I, I would take care of it. And here's what God says in this parable. If you have a crummy car, take care of your crummy car. And God will give you more. If you, have, if you live in a, in a mobile home, well, take care of the single wide and God might move you into a double wide and then if you take care of the double wide, then he might move you into a permanent house somewhere. So the Lord is asking, hey, is it, is it, 
Is it very little that you have? And you say, yes, Lord, it's so little. And he says, well, he that is faithful over little things will be faithful over big things in life. So I'm testing your heart now to see if you can be faithful with what you already have. If you own one gas station, take care of the one gas station and God may give you another one. If you have you know, one restaurant, take care of the one restaurant. And if, if you take care of it, God may give you another. If you're a first grade teacher and you want to be a college professor, well, take care of the first grade class and God will give you more because God has a dominion for you. And you have to demonstrate a capacity to be able to handle the blessings that you already have before God pours more into your life. That's the truth one of the truths of what this parable is saying. Most likely you already know what your dominion is because you have a big dream and God's already put that into your life and it's a big dream and it's a big dream because you have a big God and God has said, all right, you take dominion over this and I'll open some doors. It's never too late for me to open some doors. Uh, that's what the good news of God is. So the truth of dominion. Take care of what you have, and God might give you more. All right, here's the third truth. The truth of use, U-S-E. This truth states, basically, you have to use what you have, what God's already given you, before he gives you more. That's not complicated, is it? Two men, in this parable, two men took the talents that they had and used them, and one man didn't. One man took what God had given him and buried it. And may I just say to you that God will never give you something to bury. God is a good steward, remember, and he knows our hearts and he wants to bless us. And his blessings are limited only by our use. So Let's talk, let's, let's, let's talk in terms of money for just a second. Uh, when, God, when God blesses your life with financial resources, God blesses your life so that you can use those resources for enjoyment for yourself, for resources for your life, and for advancement for the kingdom. Not to bury somewhere and tie up somewhere and, uh, and put off to another day. God gives you those resources in order for you to use those resources. Same thing with giftings. God has gifted you in certain ways so that you can be a blessing to yourself, to others, and to the kingdom of God. You see, there are all kind of giftings that are being used in this church, I mean, right now, in this one service that we've had today. All kinds of giftings. I certainly don't have all of those giftings. I certainly can't do all of those things. And I don't think any single person in this church would have all of those giftings. I mean, Isaac and Naley with, with the media and all the cameras and all that, and Chris when he's back there, I mean, those are just gifts from the Lord that they're using because God has given them to him to advance his kingdom and to be a blessing to each other. That's why we all need each other and we all belong to each other because none of us have all of these giftings ourselves and God gives them for us to use. It's not just preachers and teachers and, 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 and singers uh, uh, that, that are gifted. I mean, we have all kinds of gifts that are being being used. We usually have a, a guard out there uh, trying to protect and make sure nobody comes in here and, and, and guns all of us down. We have people that work in the nursery. We have people that work with children. I mean, we have all kinds of things going on. Musicians, obviously, that play instruments and sing. And uh, they're all, God, God in, in, intends them to be used for the benefit of the kingdom. Let me show you Matthew 10. This is where he says that. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man receives receives a righteous man's reward. That just simply means that if you join forces with a prophet, uh, someone speaking the truth, then whatever blessing he gets, if you've joined your gift to bless and, and to be with that prophet, then you're going to get the same reward from God that he gets for, for operating in that gift. So we all, get this, we, we all get a reward 
if we use what God has given us. And God is saying that we're just part of one big team and that we all enjoy the rewards that come from serving in the kingdom. There are no big gifts, no small gifts, no big ministers, no small ministers, no big ministries, no small ministries. We all belong to the same kingdom. So some people take their gifts for granted as if they're nothing unusual. Well, there might not be anything unusual for you, but your, your, your neighbor may think, man, <laughs> that's miraculous. So that's why God put us together in a body because we all do need each other. All of our giftings can be used of the Lord unless we bury it. And why would we bury it? Because we're afraid. Maybe we, we don't feel worthy. We don't want to fail. We think we won't measure up. We think we're not spiritual enough. Well, that's what happened with this one man. He was, he was fearful. He was afraid that he might lose it or that he might not handle it just right. And, and, and so this man takes the gift that the master gave him and he hides it. And we have an enemy that is constantly trying to convince us that, that we're going to fail, that we're not gonna do it right. We're not smart enough. We're not spiritual enough. We're not handling it right. And when we become afraid then we take that which God has gifted us with or blessed our lives with and we hide it and we bury it in our life. Two men took the master's talents, invested them, used them, increased them. One man took his talent and buried it because he was afraid. Let me tell you about new callings, just one little word about new callings, about new things God puts before you. New things... I heard a phrase one time, and, and I remembered it, and it, it, seems, uh, it, seems, it seems strange, but the, the saying was, every time you reach a new level, you face a new devil. Um, in other words, every promised land that God brings you into is going to have an enemy in it. And if there's not an enemy in it, it's probably not your promised land. But for every new enemy that you face, God will give you new resources and new power. And, 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 but the enemy can, tries to continually cause us to bury what God gives us. But the gift, of use, uh, uh, the gift of use is that old refrigerator slogan that we've always used. If you don't use it, you lose it. So that's the gift. Of, let me give you one other. The truth of faith. Everything that God does he does on the basis of faith. Look at Romans 3, 27. The, the, I'm gonna give you, a, I'm, I'm gonna put it up. Did I put it? Yeah, I put it in the bottom. This is the bottom one, bottom passage there is from the Message Bible. It's the same passage as the top because uh, the top looks, I mean, it's a little, a little unusual the way it quotes it. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Here's what that verse says in, in a little easier language. So where does that leave our proud Jewish insider claims and counterclaims? Canceled? Yes, canceled. What we've learned is this, God does not respond to what we do. We respond to what God does. Here's Hebrews 11, and I know you, many of you have this passage memorized, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The master gave two of these men multiple talents and their attitude was, you're a good master. You've given us something good. And we know if we take care of it properly that you're going to be good to us in return. The man that received one talent believed that God was bad and that he was afraid of God, that God was harsh, that he was hard, that he was unreasonable. And so he mistrusted God. Now, God will not relate to us on the basis of mistrust any more than you would your own children if they came to you and said, you know I think you're a bad parent and you're not a good cook 
I'm not sure you know how to protect the house. You're a bad chauffeur, and, uh, and I'm not sure you know how to discipline properly. So prove, prove me wrong. Well, I don't think you'd knock yourself out trying to, prove, <laughs> trying to do something for someone who had that kind of bad attitude. And I'm just saying that God will not relate to us on the basis of mistrust, but without faith, it is what, highly unlikely that we would please God? It is uh, unimaginable. No, it is impossible to please God because he who comes to God must believe that he is. What, what does that mean? Well, it means that if that you believe that God is here right now, you believe that he's not some distant God up in heaven, out in the cosmos, in some faraway region with nothing to do, that he lives in you, that he walks with you, that he knows who you are, that he's a good God, that God isn't some distant punisher, that he's some um, uh, present rewarder in life. You must believe that he is that. And, 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 and everything that God blesses, us with, he blesses by faith as opposed to fear. Do you know that every, th every decision that I've ever made that I can remember, <laughs> every decision that I have ever made based on fear has been the wrong decision. It's always brought fear to light. And I'm talking about things like well, you better hurry up and buy this house or somebody else is going to buy it out from under you. Not because, you don't buy it because I, 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 the, I prayed about it and the Lord gave me peace in my heart that this is the home for me. Now I purchase it. That's, I, that's faith. But when I'm afraid that somebody's going to buy it out from under me and then I just try to be in heaven and earth to get the financing and to get it, all the money together, that, uh, that's fear. I'm afraid of something. And when I buy things out of fear, when I do things out of fear, it always turns out bad. So your concept of God affects your faith in God. If you believe that God doesn't know you, he doesn't care for you, he has no plan for your life, then you're gonna fear God and you're not gonna believe God. If you believe that God is for you and that God has a plan for your life and that he's with you and that his plan is going to be the greatest of all plans, then you'll go to God and you'll trust God and by faith, you'll believe God. So if, when I surrender what God has given me and I respect God's ownership, when I'm diligent with what he's given me and I rule over it properly, when I use it properly and I sow it properly and I don't bury it and I relate to him on the basis of faith, God will respect the truth of his word and he will honor that truth and God and my life opens up uh, to be blessed of God. And God blesses my life. Now, I, I would ask the question, uh, do you need a blessing from the Lord? But I already know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> we all do, right? In every possible way. But these are the truths that, that control whether we align ourselves with God so that he can bless our lives. Very simple. One more next week. It's a pretty big one, though. Talked about all throughout the word. But um, we can start with these four, I think. Huh? This will give you enough to work on this week? All right. Let's bow our heads in. Let's bow.